Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. My guest today is a litigator. She is a woman that wants to get kids back in school just like everyone else, but has has some reservations about how we go about that. She was integral in getting the information following the board meeting on December 15th and a big part of a big part of the realization that the board had potentially violated the Brown Act. She was great to talk to. It's it's refreshing to hear a lot of different perspectives and her hers was obviously educated and nuanced and and very valuable. So without further ado, the woman, the myth, the legend, Kathleen Delaney. How's your tea? The tea is awesome. The spot of tea. <laughs> the spot, spot of, of milk. Tea. I so appreciate that uh, that type of uh, the vernacular. I have a spot of something. <laughs> you just don't get that outside of London. Uh, my sister lived in in uh, England for several years, and so she comes back with all these little sayings that I find hysterical. But the spot of tea is the only one that I've kept. They're not really known for their food. No, but they're known for international food. What do you mean, like French food and stuff? Well, I, uh, I, for instance, I am a big fan of Indian food. Oh, God and, bless it. And I can eat a curry that is very hot here. My husband always says, whatever's going on in my mouth can't be going on in your mouth, right? So I worked in London, and I thought, oh, I'll just order my chicken vindaloo. I ordered my chicken vindaloo, and they said, well, how do you like that? And I said, oh, very hot. And they looked at me, and they said, very hot? And I said, very hot. I couldn't breathe. I was <laughs> crying. My nose was running. So the very hot in the real food in, in in London. So they have a they have a big international contingent, and the food is authentic and very good. Where do you get good Indian food around here? Because we used to have uh, there used to be the uh, Royal Indian restaurant downtown. Yes. They're gone. There's a place in Walnut Creek that's okay. So I used to go to Chutney's that was in Blackhawk Plaza, kind of in the corner by Garlic's Pizza, and now there's another Indian food place that is escaping my mind. I can't remember the name, but we ordered from there just recently, and it was very good. We door dashed. <laughs> All right, we're going to have to talk offline because I, I will kill for a good lamb sog. Like, oh, the lamb and Indian food. I, I enjoy lamb anyway, like leg lamb, barbecue lamb, but lamb sog, oh, my God. Yes. It's delicious. So here we are. There's a lot going on. And you found yourself, it sounds like, in in a position where after the decision by the board in mid-December, and you have, a, again, you have students in, the, in San Ramon. Right. One. One student. One student still. And you had an inclination that there was more to the decision, Dr. Morley's recommendation and the board's, uh, the board's decision to delay than, than we were being told. I did. And part of that was, the, if you looked at the agenda, it just had the standard agenda line update on reopening together. Everybody had gotten their classes, um, you know, the hybrid versus the remote for the lower level class for the uh, younger classes and so everybody just thought okay we're on track and then boom at the <laughs> at the meeting they reversed course and opened it up to vote and voted not to reopen and I think everybody um, that expected to have their kids go back to school uh, they were shocked and I should mention my son chose remote learning we wanted to go back to school and he chose remote not because of covid but because of the type of learning um in the hybrid method was just d wouldn't suit him gotcha the asynchronous well yeah and in my view if he was had two asynchronous days i'd be probably having to run in and rip the ps4 out of his hands during those <laughs> asynchronous days you can't blame him though it's kind of like getting mad at somebody for eating eating sugar it's just the, the type of entertainment that kids have is just so damn engaging like have you ever been on tiktok uh, yes <laughs> okay i have i have dabbled but i have I, and i don't spend any real time on it but 
I will talk to students who are like, I fell down a rabbit hole when I was doing my homework, and I came out like three hours later. And they were just streaming these 20-second TikTok videos for hours. So it's, I mean, if your son was not living around the, the age of the most engaging, engrossing entertainment the world has ever known, I'm sure he'd be a little bit more diligent. I And I totally agree. And But here's the thing. Part of the PS4 world is the social engagement because he's on there with his friends and they're screaming at each other and and they're playing football or they're playing you know, Fortnite or whatever they're playing these days and they're all talking to each other and communicating and sometimes really in these days that's kind of the limited social interaction you have right right god bless it cuz in reality like you're saying that is that is for a lot of a lot of people the only time that they're quote engaging with their peers cuz sure. they just can't they can't go and hang out. So so you guys were going to go remote learning. Okay, yes. so you had the plan. But you also felt like there was just something off about the way the agenda changed. They had this vote. The, the public wasn't made aware. So what happened then? Well, um, there was some chatter online that there, you know, there was some sort of cease and desist letter or something had happened with the union, and I wanted to see it. So I... Um, Someone had mentioned Brown Act, so I, I read it. It was painful. It's a very painful thing to read. But really what the Brown Act does is it, um, it you know, it's kind of a sunshine law, right? It means that everything that our public entities do as a board, you know, with the boards has to be open to the public. So you're allowed to know, you know, other than kind of the closed session uh, restricted items, you're allowed to know what they're going to do, why they're going to do it, and they have to give you notice if they're going to make some sort of, or take some sort of action. And so if our Board of Education, for instance, said they wanted to open a new school site or they wanted to extend the school year from, let's say, nine and a half months to 11 months, they would have to let the public know well ahead of time and say, look, we are going to be discussing this. You can have your voice. Other people will have their voices. And then we will make a decision. That's, that's in essence, what the Brown Act is. Exactly. Or if we're going to take some sort of action, we're going to put it on the agenda. We're going to give you notice. And we're going to give you a chance to you know, comment and, and learn about it. We're going to discuss it. And then we'll take the, you know, the vote, take some sort of action on it. And, and I felt, looking at the agenda from the December 15th meeting, that there was no adequate notice that Hey, we're going to rever- you know we're going to take some action. We may vote on reversing course. So I sent a letter to the to the district, saying I think you violated the Brown Act. I'd like you to cure or correct it. And there's several ways they can cure or correct it. One of which is they can m- nullify the action they took and you know go ahead and reopen the schools. The other one is they can simply put that item on the agenda again, give with 72 hours notice and and then re-debate it and, and open it up for discussion. And in essence, I'm probably getting ahead of myself, that's what they did in January. Okay, so in January they re-voted to... They didn't re-vote. What they okay. did is they put it on the agenda, they did this 37-page PowerPoint, why they're taking, you know, they took the action that they did, and they didn't need to re-vote at that point. And, and then a couple of days later, it became null and void anyways with the new restrictions in sure. California. So it, even, I think, to, to the letter of the law, they probably didn't comply with the cure correct. In spirit, they did, because they, the board went ahead and gave this huge presentation, or at least you know, Dr. Malloy did, and, and explained why they took the steps they took. Right. Well, it's always easier to apologize after you've done it, right? Yes, except uh, they never acknowledged that there was a Brown Act violation. So what was what was the impetus then for, for this long 37-page presentation? If it, It's kind of like, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm just going to go ahead and act as if I totally have. Yes. Well, I think, it, well, after I sent the letter, I engaged in some um, discussions with the district. And I said, look, the parents want information. They feel, you know, like you did this out of nowhere and so how about you you give them that information and so that's why I want I made a public records request for all documents on which they relied or communications they um, had regarding reversing course and they provided those and then not only did they provide them to me they put a public link in the presentation so anybody could see those letters 
and then provided that 37 slide PowerPoint presentation to explain why they did what they did, which is what I was after. <laughs> so what did you guys find in in the documents when, when they provided all the communication? What was there? Well, the, 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 the big document was a letter dated December 8th from the California Teachers Association written on behalf of Servia. And it's a pretty lengthy document, and it's available in that PowerPoint. And I'm not going to even pretend I can summarize it you know, off the top of my head or even paraphrase it. But it, they discussed their concerns about reopening and the spike in COVID. And, and then it went on to say, hey, these small little cohorts you have at the schools don't constitute a reopening. And so you never really reopened. And so therefore you can't continue with your reopening in, in January. And at the very end it said, you know, we're prepared to take action. So people call it a cease and desist letter. And even though they never say cease and desist, in essence, I think that that, that was the gist of the letter. What was the response to, to that letter from the, from the district? Well, the district wrote a letter back two or three days later and said, thank you, we appreciate your input, but we think we've complied with the law and we're gonna go ahead and reopen. <laughs> we're, we're proceeding, but we're gonna be discussing it at the meeting on the 15th. Wait, so the district told the union or whoever was writing this letter on behalf of the union, the district told that entity that they would be discussing this, but they never told the public. So this wasn't like a last minute thing. They knew ahead of time that they were going to be discussing it. Right. And, and really, if you look at the agenda, the agenda item says update on reopening. So the district's contention is, hey, that was more than enough. You know, that's the same agenda item we've had on there for every board meeting so you should have known that meant we're going to discuss the update and the update includes maybe taking action and voting because it was under action items oh so it's it, essentially it's something that's always on the menu that people should know is a potential a potential thing there but nobody knew the extent of action that would be taken on it it could have just been furthering the discussion or saying where they were as far as you know what what plans they had in in action Right. If I said to you, hey, I'm going to give you an update on our reopening, what do you think? <laughs> that I'm going to tell you, hey, you know, we've, we've given everybody their schedules and we're ready to go. It's not, hey, we, we've changed our minds and we're not going to reopen. And, and that was my argument to the, to the board. And, and in fairness, they did respond with a letter saying we will never use that description again. We, you know, we'll, we'll do better next time. Right. I mean, an update is kind of like, if you say I'm going to update you about your grades, that doesn't really mean if if you were a teacher and I was a student, you're like, I'm going to update you on your grades on Friday. I'm not anticipating that there's a final and something that's going to happen on Friday. I'm assuming that you're saying like, okay, well, this is how you've done on your homework and this is how you've done on your test and this is kind of where you are. Right. Or, you know, if... if someone's remodeling your house and you tell your the contractor says hey let's get together on Friday I'll give you an update on the remodel you don't expect him to say oh by the way I'm not doing it anymore <laughs> that's yeah. not the update all right so so they won't do that again that's good yeah. so what happened then you saying hey look you need to cure correct they do this 37 37 page PowerPoint and now is everybody just kind of like okay great thanks for that uh, that, well, that's a, 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 the reaction of many of the parents that thought, okay, that's a little too little too late, right? And I'm a little more practical, and I, 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 on the legal side, I see that, you know, in essence, if we had a legal challenge, the court would probably look at that and go, you know, and they complied with the spirit of the law. They gave you 37 slides as to why they did what they did. They discussed it at length. What else do you want? So... And really, if we filed a suit, it, it would they could just correct it by putting it, calling a special meeting, giving 72 hours notice, and revoting again. So it, it I mean, I, I'm kind of looking long term, right. and and really, what I wanted was to get that information out. That was the whole point of it was to to understand why the district did what it did, and to, and to see the communications back and forth with with the union. Right. I, I, when I spoke with Dr. Malloy last week, I actually told him that I, I'm very concerned about the 
I'm concerned about the union, not not in the classic sense that a lot of people talk about, in that you know, like, oh, the union has too much power. The union. I'm really concerned about the viability of the union in this community after all of the dust settles in this situation, because it, with this letter, for instance, right there, it appears as if there's pressure being put on behind the scenes from the union, or at least this this group of attorneys that was representing the CTA or Servia, whoever, right. and they're writing to our superintendent and the board saying, hey, we're going to take action if you don't listen to us. And that's a really concerning thing. Now, I don't know, I obviously would not presume to speak for the board or, or Dr. Malloy if they if they told me, hey, look, that was, we understand we got that, but that was not something that really persuaded us. We had our own reasons, then I'd believe them. But it, it's very easy for, I think, community members to see that and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. They have these, these teams of attorneys that write these letters and then all of a sudden the board totally reverses course. It's a little bit more than a coincidence and it's a little hard to defend that action. And the problem with this in my opinion, is that people are going to get such a poor opinion of the union because it appears that they're pulling far more, or excuse me, they're they're pulling a lot of strings behind the scene that we're going to lose the union in in our community, or at least lose a lot of the benefit that we've gotten from it because we have benefited from having a union. We have fantastic teachers. We have smaller class sizes. Like the union has produced great things for us. But now, when you have something like this, where it appears as if the union had at least some push in getting the Board of Education and the superintendent to recommend and then reverse course, that's a really dangerous kind of perception. Wouldn't you agree? I agree. And, you know, I I have two kids, one who's a freshman in college and one who's a junior in in high school. And they went through Montero, they went through Charlotte Wood and San Ramon Valley High School. They've had wonderful teachers. I mean, wonderful teachers. Still do. My son has wonderful teachers this year. And I've always been a big supporter of the union. Wearing red, supporting the teachers. I'm I'm pretty left-leaning for this community. (laughs) Right. And I do think that the union has done a lot of good for the teachers and I have a lot of friends who are teachers in this district the problem is that this I think this has created a huge divide between the union and a a large group of parents who see the union as the the barrier between you know keeping their kids from going back to school fair or you know true or not and right that's the perception yeah that's the perception and and it really I think at some point doesn't matter how true it is if that's the perception because then you get you have this even bigger divide that that's happening and I I listened to your um, interview your talk with Dr. Malloy and he said that's you know that the union's concerns were one of like three factors right so one of the factors but I think in um, the heads of and the perception of many of the parents that is the factor and I, you know, I read an article in the New York Times about, uh, I think it's Montclair, New Jersey. Did you see that article? I did not. Where they were all set to go back to school, and they didn't because the the union sent a letter saying we will not go back, and they had to at the last minute send a letter to the parents saying, "I'm sorry, we can't reopen. We don't have enough teachers to staff the schools." And I think that that's the perception you're getting here is even if we did reopen. The teachers aren't going to show up which i don't you know i don't know if that's true or not true i don't know enough about that and i think there are a lot of teachers that want to come back and i think as dr malloy said unfortunately you know the the parents get to choose but the teachers don't necessarily get to choose and i'm i'm not sure how i feel about that quite frankly right and i i think that's just an impossible situation because you are so connected to the educator that's working with your kid Right? Like if you have a kindergarten teacher or a second grade teacher, you got to really believe in that person when they're working with you like your five-year-old or your seven-year-old, right? And if you don't have a good rapport with them or if you don't feel like everybody's on the same page, that can be a really stressful relationship. I had – my son was in, um, in first grade at one of the local elementary schools and we did not, did not get on with the, with the teacher and – there were a couple things that happened with the administration that ultimately led us to leaving the school. And 
And it was a very painful thing because I kept saying like, look, I don't have unreasonable expectations. I have expectation of safety and some compassion for the six year old, right? And mind you, crack the whip on him, like that's fine. But there were things that just went so far beyond it. Every day when we were sending our kid to school, it was a really dark thing. Like it was not, we tried to put on this really happy face and, and be be positive about it. But when we were leaving after dropping our kid off, my, my wife and I were just kind of like, oh my gosh, how many more days? How many more days? So again, you need to have that really, really close bond. That's why teachers, I think, have such such a connection to the community because again, it's a it's a people business and you can't you can't have education without that trust and connection. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I and it's I think it's hard sometimes to differentiate between the union, the union, right, in quotes, and the teachers that make up the union, because I, I don't, in my view, I don't think that they're always necessarily aligned. Right. Right. It's just a group. It's just a group of people. It happens to be a reasonably large group of people right. for the area, right? I mean, you're talking about a thousand or two thousand members, right? And there's money involved. Yeah. And there are a lot of different opinions involved, but it's just a group of people. So to say, well, the union wants this, or the union wants, okay, well, what's the union, right? Like who who wants this? Oh, no, 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 it's the union as a whole. Okay, well, what are you saying the union as a whole? What, what a ridiculous statement. It's like saying, it would be the same thing as just saying like every woman wants this or every man wants it. It's like, how how does that work? You're just grouping people together. They just happen to be part of it. But no, I, I have not seen anyone say, the union members are 100% aligned. Right. But again, there there are, I spoke with a teacher. I, I know I know several of the teachers, elementary teachers, and I spoke with one recently. Um, she's a family, I worked with her son. And she said, look, I don't, I don't agree with what's going on, okay? She, she personally would like to be back in school and she thinks we should be back in school. I said, great. And she said, but you know, honestly, I don't, I don't really want to stick my neck out because at the end of the day, I'm still going to be colleagues with everyone, right? Like the people that don't want to go back, if I stick my neck out and say, look, I really think for our kids' sake or for our community's sake, we should be going back. Let's make a push here. For the people that don't want to, she's going to be stuck with them for the next 10 or 20 years as you know, as long as she works. Right. And I thought about that and it was kind of like, you know, I take – not everybody agrees with the things I say on this podcast. And I don't take crazy positions. My position is, hey, tell me what you think. I'd love to hear what you think. That's my position. Right. And the more people we can get discussing respectful, meaningful opinions, the better off we're all going to be. That's my opinion, okay? But even that, some people get very bothered by it. And I was thinking about it. I was like, you know, I can do this. Because if somebody's bothered by the fact that I that I entertain or excuse me interviewed Kathleen or Dr. Malloy or Ann Katzberg or whoever, I don't have to see that person. You know, maybe they wouldn't send their kid to SAT prep. That's fine. But at the end of the day, it doesn't affect me that much. I can I can have I can step out a little bit and take a little risk. But for other people, specifically people that happen to be represented by the union and have colleagues that they can't get away from. It's a really difficult situation. I think the communication is just very risky and they don't want to be alienated. And And I'm sure the people that are worried about going back don't want to feel like their colleague is trying to put them in a terrible position either. Right. Well, and you've got to also think the parents feel the same way, right? If, if we don't really know as parents, unless the teachers have told the kids which teachers want to come back, which teachers are hesitant to come back. And I think there, you know, there are parents that are worried about alienating the teachers and having a negative effect on on the kids as well. So, and I'm I'm kind of in the I, I'm aligned with you. I want that information out there so people can evaluate it and make the best decision for themselves and their families and and understand what's being done and why it's being done. Right. Right. I had a student in here the other day. It was hilarious. She's a fa- she's an absolute hoot. I was like, hey. When's the last time some guy that you didn't like at all asked you out on a date awkwardly? And she was like, oh, my God, it was terrible. <laughs> she tells the whole class's story. And we're all dying because it's so funny because she's great. Like, I love the student. And she's just telling me how this guy, 
really like liked her and her friend told the dude that that you know she was into it so he like brings a fish bowl to school with a fish in it and says like i i fish you would go to homecoming with me or something crazy right so now she's walking around school with a fish bowl like what am i going to do with and so she has to go to homecoming with him this is years ago i was just dying cuz it's kind of like do you really want to be at a dance with somebody who doesn't want to be there with you right you don't want that like right. You, you should make the proposal as bland as possible and say, look, this needs to be a mutually beneficial relationship. If you don't want to be here, and I don't know that it's a great idea if we force you. Now, again, obviously, I'm not – I don't have any idea about policy, right? But giving teachers a choice, not giving teachers a choice. I just know that if I was required to go to homecoming with somebody I didn't like, that would be a little awkward. I, I don't think you should take that into consideration with the people that make the decision, but I can I can relate a little bit. Yes, and <laughs> so I um at, I I was the managing partner at my firm, and when COVID hit, and I had to make the decision, you know, how do we implement the COVID policy? And you know, I uh, lawyers are not essential employees as much as they like to think they're important. They are not essential. <laughs> so I you know sent everybody home, and I said everybody's going to work from home. I mean, it was a big undertaking. We had to set up computers, and this is for the support staff as well. Well, there were a couple support staff that found that they just couldn't work at home. It just didn't work. They needed the scanner. They needed the tools that are at the office. Right. So we made accommodations for them to come into the office because we had 10,000 square feet and two people. So right. there, there was plenty of, of spacing. And I, I would love to be able to do that with the teachers to accommodate all of them. I, I, and I, at the beginning of all this, I was kind of naive. Well, hey, you know, if the teachers want, are you know, do, aren't comfortable coming in. Let them teach the remote class, and let the people that come, you know, want to right. come in, teach the people. And I, I thought, oh, that you know, the numbers let, should work out. But of course, that's not really how it works. Right, right. But then again, we do live in California, and wedding tent rental companies could have been living their best lives by setting up tents everywhere outside. You know, I mean, we did that with restaurants. But again, neither here nor there. I'm obviously not going to present anything new to the discussion of how we could have made an outdoor education system work. They've done it at Davis, where my daughter is. In of school. course, they've done it. They've done it at De La Salle. <laughs> they've done it everywhere. Right. They but, put uh, up the big tents and the, right. the classes that they needed in person. They're sitting outside. You we know. live in California. Right. Like even on rainy days, it's a nice day. You know, like it's not. It's okay. Well, let me let me give you the opposite. My dad lives in Anchorage. Ooh. Okay, on bad days there, they're bad days, right? Like the East High School, My, uh, I have a bunch of adopted siblings, um, and they go to East High School in Anchorage. It's the most diverse high school in the United States. And it's all it's just a giant cement block, right? Because you can't, you don't mess around outside at all like you're doing. You're running indoors for, for all of the stuff when you're doing PE and all of your classes are indoors. It's kind of like Northgate on steroids. But <laughs> anyway, so so you go through the whole... Correct and cure, or cure and correct. I'm not C and C, whatever it is. Right. What happens after that? Because that's when people really started kind of losing it. It seems like the Brown Act violation was was one of the last straws for for some people that really wanted to go back to school and felt so disappointed that that they lost it on December 15th. And then this came out that it, it, it appeared as if people knew this was going to be the case ahead of time and they weren't let in on it. What happened after that? Well, then I think, you know, there was, uh, there's a pretty large contingent of parents that really want their kids back in school. And they started the recall effort. And there were a number of grounds for the recall. I mean, the most prominent being that they thought the board members weren't representing their interests and weren't listening. And, and then one of the grounds was my letter, the Brown Act violation, which would not my letter, but the, the board's Brown Act violation. And um, so they started the recall process for three of the board members that were already have have been on the board for a significant amount of time, and for the two new board members, they couldn't start the recall petition because you can't do that until they've been um, on the board for 90 days. So um, then you know it started to get a little bit of local media, and then you know they were connecting my uh, letter to the recall effort, which they're actually two distinct things. The, the Brown Act 
letter and the request for um, public disclosure of the documents was just my attempt to get more information out there and to understand why the board was doing what it did and to let the board know we're watching you, right? You can't just reverse course without telling us why or giving us some sort of notice. And I really do think that's an important aspect of, of the school board is that everybody should be informed. All the stakeholders should know what you're doing and why you're doing it. I mean, it seems simple, right? Right, right. And totally fair. I mean, these are elected representatives. And I understand they're not making a lot of money, right? Like you can't make a career out of the $400 a month <laughs> stipend that they get. So I understand that to some degree it's it's a, a labor of love, a commitment to the, to the community. But the community takes it very, very seriously too. It's not just like, oh, here's this nice person who's volunteering. It's no, no, no. You're representing me. Right. You're supposed to be representing my child's best interest. And when you don't, you should be taken off the board. And so that kind of seems to be the heart of, of the recall, obviously. I think it is the heart of the recall. And so they've, you know, they've started this process. They've, go ahead, they've, they've served the board members. Now you know, the next step is to get a, a significant number of uh, signatures and then to file those. And then there's a, a, an election. And it, it may be a special election. It just depends when it lines up with other elections. Um, but it, w whatever it is, it's called a non-standard election. And so there, and he, here's my hesitation. I fully support these parents. And here's, I, I love this. This is what I love about our country. Here's the democratic process, right? You have this right to recall. And I, and I, I am aligned with the parents that want to get their kids back in school. And let me tell you, it's passionate on both sides. It's pa there's a lot of passion in the community right now. Right, and I mean, I um, I took ownership of my letter on in the, the there's parents of the SRV USD Facebook group, and I got some vitriolic <laughs> comments from some of the parents that have no desire to go back and don't want people back and they think that it's a waste of the district's resources to be responding to public records requests and you know what did you gain out of this and wait could, could we back up because i yeah. i have never fully understood this point okay and, and i'm sorry if everybody else understands it you have people that don't want to go back and that's fine and your son again was electing for the for the distance learning model as well so fine right right now the, the people that don't want to go back that got really angry at you, why were they angry at you? So I, I think, uh, like you, I think, why would you be angry with me? If you don't want to go back, keep your kids at home and let our kids go back. I mean, it seems an, a simple solution, right? Everybody gets what they want. But I, I think that they... Um, there's, there's a couple different things I've read into their responses. One, they're worried about the community spread, that if, if schools open back up, there's gonna be more community spread. And two, they don't wanna force the teachers to go back. They, you know, and like I said, I'm a little torn on that as well. I, you know, I, I feel like teachers have a, a job, but in, in my perfect world, the teachers that don't feel comfortable coming back can teach from their home and the, those that do can come in so I don't I don't pretend to have the, the perfect you know solution for this because it, it's a difficult situation right. but the, the there's and you know what it's it's a really small number of people that are very very vocal oh very vocal and mean <laughs> they're just mean you know what when when uh when I interviewed uh Lorraine and and Jen Droff and there was a fine, fine conversation. There was no, nobody had any problem with anything we said. And then Lorraine got into a, a, a thing with, with somebody else in the community. The, I'm 99% sure the same people that came after you were the ones coming after me because they wanted me, they're like, you support a bully, you're a terrible person. And it blew me away. I was like, you're, you're saying horrendous things. You're saying, you're, you're making all these just ridiculous leaps and accusations. And, and I invited to the last person, I invited every single one of them onto the podcast. And I said, listen, it, you are clearly passionate. You clearly have a position. If you would like to talk about it person to person, 
I will, I will, whatever platform you think I offered Lorraine, I'll offer you the exact same. Not a single one of them wanted to come on. And I think, I honestly think it's because it's really hard to be mean in person. Because if you sit down in front of, you ever heard of, um, uh, man, what's his name? Daryl, it's not Daryl Hayes. It may be Daryl Hayes. Uh, African-American gentleman converted something like 200 or 300 KKK members to leave the Klan. And he did it literally by just being nice to them and sitting down with them and talking. Like he would interview the, the Grand Wizard, like all these different <laughs> things. And he's a, he's a blues musician and just fell into talking and befriending people. And they, they, they realized they're like, oh, well, you, all the things that I thought about African Americans, you obviously are not. And he, again, just talking, 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 and be becoming a human being. And it's so unfortunate that we have this medium that so many people use in the community, right? Like we have the social media, we have Facebook, these Facebook groups that are totally polarized, by the way. I got kicked out of one of them. Yeah, right. So there's there's the back to school safely, and then there's the San Ramon Valley parents. And the San Ramon Valley parents kicked me out. I had done nothing. I have never posted anything inflammatory. I've never been terrible to anyone. And now, like, I can't, they don't want me there, which is fine. That's that's their call. Somebody owns that group and runs it, and, and good for them. But I, I just wish if one of them really wanted to and had something good to say and, and a good point, they would just come and talk to me face to face because it's very difficult to do, to say the things that they were saying to you in person. And that's one of the first steps that would stop the divide from continuing to grow. We are, we are being hijacked by this communication medium, right? It's too easy to be mean. It's too easy to read into things people say. It's too easy to respond quickly and, and aggressively. That's what's happening. That's what happens with this medium. If we took that medium away and we had to like hash it out in the town square face to face, we would not hate each other the same way. And it's not like I hate anyone, but. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't have the same dialogue. It wouldn't be the dialogue in the same way. And it, it's funny you should say that because in the court system, when in litigation, when you have a dispute over something, typically the courts require attorneys to do something called meet and confer. And that's where you have to go back and forth and give your views and try and work it out before you go into court and say we can't you know we can't work this out a lot of the courts these days are saying the meet and confer cannot be in letter writing you can't have a letter writing campaign you can't have an email com campaign anymore you have to meet face to face i mean actually get in the same room and meet and confer <laughs> this is in the legal world they make you do this the courts do yes this is amazing yeah they make attorneys the attorneys who are fighting with each other which right Imagine that. And and um, nowadays it's via Zoom or via telephone call, but you have to actually discuss because I think the courts realize just what you said, which is you tend to work things out better. You're, you're more civil and you try and you can see the other person and understand where they're coming from. And things tend to get worked out or at least the issues get narrowed when you're meeting face to face because when you're going back and forth in these snide little comments and believe me I've gotten caught up in it when I I, I, try, I took ownership of that letter and I said I really what my my comment was hey I'm the person that wrote that and here's why I did it I just wanted to get that information out and I do think that the district and of course I mean the first response was a very vitriolic like bullying and you know you suck <laughs> kind of thing. god how dark and so I I, I, I took a breath and I responded I go you know it's funny that that there's so much there's so many allegations of bullying and really I think that you might be the biggest bully on this particular parents site I'm, I'm trying to tell you why I did and then there were other people that clearly were aligned with the, hey, we don't want to go back, but we're totally respectful, asking why, you know, why I said what right. I said. Or, and to me, that's a respectful dialogue because you're just trying to hear what the other person has to say. And I can, I mean, I know I've learned a lot and I've kind of moved from really far, far one side to not more center, but to understanding some of the arguments being made and some of the decisions that are being made. Right, right. And 
I was talking to some students in class uh, a couple weeks ago about uh, the the nature of cancer and cancel culture, okay? Because they're the way adults behave, students obviously pick up, okay? And now you have young people, like 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds, that, are, that go on these campaigns, like multi-year campaigns to get somebody, quote, canceled. So there, there are instances where people will uh, like scrub someone's social media account uh, for for years, going back to times when they're in middle school. Find anything that could be interpreted as slightly offensive, or or whatever you think, and m- actually make full social media accounts dedicated to slandering these people, the the people they want canceled, and it 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 kills me because it's a terrifying world that our kids are now navigating. Like, you're responsible for what you said when you were in sixth grade. You're responsible for how somebody took a text from you in eighth grade. You're responsible for all these things. And it's going to come home to roost when you're like a junior in high school trying to just make it through your day. And it's no surprise that they're doing this because this is what adults do too. We talk about cyberbullying. We talk about um, protecting our youth. We talk about, you know, uh, keeping them, all, all of the horrible things that happen to young people. Oh, these poor young people, it's so terrible. We exhibit the worst behaviors. <laughs> We're doing it ourselves. I think that's absolutely true. And I've had to take a breath and, you know, kind of step back and, and look at myself and see, am I doing that? And, you know, I, I was not, I was not always the nicest in my responses, but it was, more my sarcastic nature coming out like okay let me put this in a little bit simpler terms for you so that you can understand it (laughs) my god you got to get some laughs laughs here there man (laughs) i mean if you're gonna if they're gonna come at you you got to get something out of it well so it's my kids know that once i start speaking softly they are in huge trouble, right? When the screaming stops and then I get quiet, they better just run. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, my kids are still pretty young, but they pretty much know that. They could be throwing a fit, and if I'm yelling back at them, like my nine-year-old's loser, I'm like, Wah! we're going back and forth. But the second everything drops and I get really close to them and yeah. talk really quietly, and then he's like, oh, my God, here it comes. <laughs> Now I'm in trouble. This is the equivalent of my mother calling me by all of my names when I was younger, right? Like, you know, the Kathleen God, that's Mary. <laughs> great. I, yeah, we do that all the time in my house. I have three boys. They're bananas. Like, they're screaming and yelling all day long. So, you know, a lot of middle names come out. Yeah. Um, so, so the recall's starting. Right. Right. And they're recalling the three board members that have been there long enough. What do you think about the recall? Well... I know that's a very loaded question, by the way. It is a loaded question. So on the one hand, I really appreciate the recall because I think that that's part of the democratic process. That, I mean, there's a reason that that mechanism is in place. And if parents feel like there are board members that are not representing the interests of the stakeholders, that is the mechanism you can use to get them out, right, to to recall them. And, um, I mean, Lord knows, it's, you know, there's a big push for Gavin Newsom, right? We've gone through it in our state with our governor before. And I think that there's kind of certain long-term things that I look at. So on in the short term, I'm all for it. Let's, let's have our voices heard. Let's get that recall out there. Let's let them know we are not happy with the decisions you're making, how you're making those decisions, the lack of transparency, and the fact that, um, and you know, kind of, I don't want to speak um, for this whole group, but that, and I think you nailed it earlier, is that it seems that the board is catering or afraid of the union, right? I mean, true or not, that's the that's perception. the perception. Yes, yes, yes. And so, at what point, you know, if enough people perceive it, does it then become reality, right? I mean, it, it, at some point, it doesn't matter because that's the perception. Right. So. Um, so I think I, I really like that part of it, right? These parents are motivated. They want their kids back in school, and I feel for them, and I understand why. There is so many things wrong with remote learning. I watch my kid get up and run around the house in between classes trying to stay awake. You know, I see him laying in bed on his side, 
in class, right? It, this is not class. And we try and institute, hey, you gotta be sitting at your desk. Am I there all the time? No, and so do I think that he's um, learning as much as he would as if he was sitting in class and looking at the teacher? No, I don't. It's a really tough way to learn. So um, I get it. And I, and I think, I mean, I did say my son opted for distance learning, but not because of COVID concerns, because of concerns about the hybrid. And I know Dr. Malloy mentioned this in, in your talk. I just think it's a terrible <laughs> option. It seemed like a rather distasteful setup. Yes. And, and even when you're talking about socialization, it's like, well, what if you, you know, you're not even in a cohort with your friends? Then you're still not seeing any of your friends. And my son plays sports. He's continued to play baseball. He's playing, he's you know, participating in football. Well, now there is, you know, no. Right, right. no football, yeah. Right. But, but baseball practice starts up again this week. So in the, you know, aligning with the cohorts and all the good stuff, wearing their masks, Fine. Just get out of the house and do, right. and do something. Oh my god, I cannot wait for the time for my, our kids to be out of the house. I like it is really, they're like just cats, just all the time. Just like get out. You got, you guys need to be separated. You need to be out of the house in activities in school. Yes, yes. Well, just get out. So we live in a little cul-de-sac with just four houses, and the house across from us has three kids. And in the middle of the day, they're out there on that trampoline that's kind of off in their side yard all the time and I can tell the parents are like just go outside and jump on the trampoline because they're probably all going crazy trying to do their school and they're you know students at Monterre and I feel for the parents and you know I, God bless them I hear the kids outside you know riding their scooters back and forth and you, you got to do something to, to help them so. you got to do something and again with little kids they're so energetic and they're not supposed to be trapped in it. Like my my kids very luckily go to school for about four hours a day, but they're home at like, they're, they're done at 12, right? So then from 12 until seven when they go to bed, they're just like crawling on each other, and hitting and biting and just, there's like a nail in there somewhere. And yeah, they just, they're all over each other where normally they would be at school till three or 3.30 and then we, we would take them to jujitsu a couple times a week. So they'd be getting energy out there and you know, they had their own friends and their own spaces and stuff and gosh, it's rough. Yeah, it is. And I mean, and I, I feel like there are things the the district could be doing. I know they offered, for instance, I think the SAT in the fall for mm -hmm, the seniors. Mm -hmm. Why aren't they doing that for the juniors in the spring? I mean, I know there's a lot of moving parts, but why, why wouldn't they get together and offer an SAT for the juniors in the spring? That's a tremendous question. One that I would really actually like to know the answer to because Greg Marvel, when when I was interviewing him, he was bringing that up, saying we're getting this lined up for the seniors, and he pushed really hard right. to make sure the seniors had an opportunity to take the test, even when we knew, even when we knew that a lot of schools were test optional, if not all of them by that point. But he really felt it was important for the students to have a chance to take it, which was great. Because again, there's still scholarships, there's still NCAA things, there's still different different uh, colleges within universities that may have looked at it. And to just rob students of that opportunity was, was really not something you want to do. I have not heard the same push from the current superintendent or the board to say, hey, look, we're, we're getting this lined up. Because by the way, other schools are. Like De La Salle and Crondelet, private schools have test dates set up in the month of March. And we could be doing the exact same thing. I asked the same question. I actually asked that question. And, you know, what I heard was there's a lot of moving parts and, you know, it's difficult to do. Well, that's great. You don't think this is difficult for our kids? Meanwhile, my kid got his SAT canceled in December and he's going to Texas in March to take the SAT because I know they'll, <laughs> they're going to be giving it in yeah. So, Texas isn't gonna mess around. Yeah, <laughs> they're 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 having sports, school, whatever, right? Yeah. I mean, it's all in. One, uh, I spoke with a a colleague of mine, uh, a woman by the name of Michelle Myers. She's a college counselor, and we were talking about talking about the SAT and and what it means for juniors. And it was a very good episode, by the way. I highly recommend it for anybody with a sophomore in particular and a junior because we talked about what was going on. But one of the big things you have to realize is, as frustrating as it may be. That, that California is not doing a great job and our school district may not be doing a great job administering these tests, 
we are in the minority as far as the country goes. Like people in Idaho are taking the test. Arizona taking the test. Nevada, they're taking the test. They have their schools open and they are administering this test that will be like if you think that just because the Bay Area is not taking it, that all of a sudden the schools across the country will not be looking at it. That's not the case. Now, if you're applying to the UC system, right, you don't need it. So great, that's good. Or the CSUs, fine. But private schools, right, out of state schools, they're not messing around because their students are taking the test. So it is something that our that our district needs to get on. But again, let, back to, if I may. Yes, I know. <laughs> sorry. The, no, it's fine. We're, just, we're all over. So the, the recall, you, you understand the, you appreciate the democratic process. You understand where people are coming from. I feel like there's a but at the end of this, though. There is a but. And okay. he, here's my, so on the one hand, I'm all for it because I really do believe in this process. On the other hand, I've done a little bit more research into what the recall entails. And um, I, um, if you go to the registrar, the county registrar, what I learned is there's, you know, now that we have five districts, right, it's not just at large, it's five different districts. Each district has roughly 20,000 registered voters. Some have 19, some have 23, but let's just say 20,000. Um, and so for the three members that we're recalling, we have to say 60,000 registered voters. If this gets pushed through for a non-standard election, right, one that even if it's not a special election, if it's held with other elections, it's still considered a non-standard election. It's the cost to the district is four to ten dollars per registered voter. So sixty thousand registered voters, even if they don't all vote, the cost per registered voter would put us at a quarter million to six hundred thousand dollars. Correct. That's a big chunk of change. And that's just for those three districts. So, and if, you know, we start the recall process for the other the two. The other board, two zones. Yeah. Then we're, we're, we're really far up there. So that's one consideration, you know, thinking, do, we, do I want the district to, you know, put that much money out there? And then the, the second part, I'm kind of looking at the very long-term consequences, is other districts that have had gone through recall and had recall turmoil have um, had their credit rating reduced. I mean, Wait, back up. What's, what's recall turmoil? Well, we're, we're, this is like we're breaking up and I'm crying. No, and no, no. Like standing outside other, your house with a boom box. And... I, I, that's just my own um, in, in artful term. It, what I, I mean, other districts that have gone through recalls, they, because there's so much turmoil within the district that's associated with a recall, right? Parents are unhappy. They, I mean, if you get to the step of this, they, um, they're they not seen as being as credit worthy as districts. Like our, our district has a very, 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 very good credit rating. And what this means for our district is when, you know, when it comes to bonds, they get a very, very, very low interest rate. <laughs> so if the credit rating goes down, I mean, it's just like, you know, buying a car or buying a house, right? If, the, if you have a bad credit score, you pay a a higher interest rate so for the district over you know the next 10 to 20 years that could be millions and millions and millions of dollars in higher interest payments which okay you know who, who pays that we do that's our property right. taxes right the the stakeholders we're all paying that so that's my my concern with this so I'm, I'm trying to take this long-term approach in the short term I'm thinking yeah, this is why, you know, they have that process in there. In the long term, I'm thinking this is not good for our district. And maybe the district will look at it. Maybe the board members will say this is not good for the district and they'll resign and, you know, someone else will get appointed. And the other kind of part of the recall, I think um, most people know, but maybe not everyone, is it's not that the board member is just gone it's, there's another election, and that board member can run in that election again, the, the recalled board member, and win. So at the end of the day, you could end up with the same board member that you had before. Is that is that possible? Because I've heard it both ways. I've heard that that person can't run again in the special election, and then I've also heard it that that they could be 
they could be on the ballot. I am not going to pretend to be a complete expert. But okay, my, but let's, research, let's say we it's possible. Let's yes. just put that out there. I do think, I, I from what I've read and seen, yes, they can put their name, you know, they can opt. Like, I don't, I, I'm not going to run, but they can put their name back, you know. You'd get, be great. You should run. No, I'd be terrible. People hate me. I, 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 at least I, at least a couple people hate you on Facebook. <laughs> you know why? Because I, I, I tend, I have a, a decent filter after my 20 years in law, but I tend to just speak my mind. And so I, I probably would not have appealed to a lot of people. <laughs> I will never have I will never have a spot in politics anywhere. I barely have a spot in my own house. I just can't. I will never never be the voice of reason for anyone else. My poor husband sometimes he goes, he's you did what? You said what? <laughs> what don't, did you put that on Facebook? Oh my <laughs> You know, it's it's such a weird thing when people quarterback your communication with other people cuz it's kind of like like sometimes I'll, my wife will listen to uh, to the conversations I have with people on the interviews, and she's like, "Why didn't you say this? Or why didn't you say this?" I was like, well, if you were there in the moment, maybe that wasn't going through my head, or like maybe I was thinking about something else. And you never know all. You can't recreate ever perfectly the exact situation you were in. And you're like, you know what? It seemed like a good idea at the time, and I just said it. All right. So like, let's just we gotta we gotta get on with ourselves here. Right, let's move on. Yeah, move right. on. I say that to my son sometimes because he, he he gets some stuff. He says, "Mom, mom," yeah, and I hate this term, but he uses it because this is the high school term. He says, don't, "Please don't be a Karen. Please don't." Oh my god! Oh my god! I have a Karen goat shirt that I want to make. It's the it's the goat, and I put the Karen haircut on. I'll have to show you afterwards. It's it's, it's amazing. <laughs> I think it would be like it would be. Uh, the number one most polarizing item I've ever made because some people would love it and then there would be the other people. <laughs> well, <laughs> I spoke at the, I commented at the last board meeting when it, so I became an agenda item at, hey, the, at the January. Look at you. <laughs> right. We're moving up in the world, right? And my son was horrified. Mom, <laughs> you're an agenda item. And I said, well, I'm going to make a comment. And so we were in my home office he actually pulled up a beanbag and sat there because he wanted to hear what i was going to say he was so God worried bless it. and so i i spoke and it was really more legalese than anything sure and you know what and i and i i did thank um the people that i dealt with greg medici and the outside council they were they were fabulous and very open and very transparent and what else do you want in you know, we're going to give you these things. If there's something else that you want that you you don't have, we'll give it to you. So they they were great, and um, and so he sat on the beanbag and listened to me. And you know, I, I got done. He goes, "Okay, good job, mom. You weren't a Karen." <laughs> good job. <laughs> you were. God, there's just something about speaking to the manager, though. There's just, I really want to make the shirt, put the Karen goat on it, and put, I want to speak to the manager of college. <laughs> that, would, <laughs> that would be so perfect. So here's a question for you. You spoke short and then long term. The middle term, though, okay? Right. Let's say that the the recall goes through, okay, and they, they slot a special or a, a non-standard election, however you want to term right. it. How long does that take? Like, what's that process? You know, I don't have the timeline exactly in front of me because there's a range of times to get every little thing completed. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. COVID. Tea down the wrong bike. <coughs> oh, my God. I don't have the Rona, I promise. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> <coughs> it was the Tower of London tea. It's delicious. So there's there's a range of... of time frames for each step right so you this could be this has to be 30 to 90 days this has to be so it could be nine months six to nine months before all this takes place so okay let's back up it okay it could be six to nine months so we could be in june july or even september october before the turnover and I or, or is that before the election or before <laughs> before the election. And I would think that that is being very optimistic. So I'm thinking it would be September to December time time frame. So as far as the effectiveness then, for this being a, 
for this being an immediate cure for the problems that people are facing. The problems are real, right? Like, I'm not trying to minimize anything. Very real. At, at all. What I'm saying is people have been, over the last 45 to 60 days, people have just lost it. They're like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And the recall along, uh, along with your Brown Act has kind of come out of this, which is, hey, you know, this isn't right anymore. Okay, and they're looking at it as a means to correct that wrong. But we wouldn't like the odds are we'll be back in school before this comes to pass anyway. Right. Yes. And and as you know, there was a lot of brouhaha because, you know, Dr. Malloy wouldn't commit that we'd be back in the fall. And rightly so. I mean, I think he's learned his lesson about committing, right? He wants to be very precise in his language. I think that that's probably almost a direct quote. You know, if I may, I'm sorry about this. I, I was thinking about this because I listened to the conversation over, and I thought this in the moment, but he kept talking. When he says, I learned that I had to be more precise, I felt like that was, that was not true. And I'll tell you why. He was precise, he was 100% clear. Nobody had any misunderstanding about what he was conveying. Right. What he actually meant is, I will be less, com I will be more non-committal. It's not that he was vague or unexacting in his speech. It's that he was exactly, he was like, we will be back unless. Yes. So it's not that he wasn't clear. Well, and what he, yes, what he didn't do is add a second condition to the unless. Right. We will be back unless, you know, the county tells us we can't or unless there's a huge spike, which everybody knew was coming. <laughs> that's the, I mean, that's the terrible part of it is as much as everybody was taken by surprise by the reversal because of his precise language before, which was unless the county tells us we cannot go back. And he had that, oh, that was the, the second part is, there was a reference to a, a letter from, um, oh, come on, what's his name? Doctor. Oh, um, it starts with an F. F. Uh, Dr. F. <laughs> there <laughs> we go. <laughs> Dr. F at the county. Right. Uh, the, you know, that everybody calls Dr. Doom these days, right? Mm. Yeah. So, That's dark. and he actually sent a letter saying, yep, you're clear to reopen. You've yes. met all the requirements. And so that, that was, was something like November 11th. Or right. And that was right? the secondary request yes. because that was mentioned in one of the, um, in one of the letters. And they, and I asked, after the fact, ask the district, oh, can I have that too? And they sent it right away. There was no problem with that. Um, so you're right. I mean, everybody thought, well, they, they said we can reopen. We're going to reopen. So right. I think what Dr. Malloy learned is it's not that he has to be less committal. It's that he really needs to say unless – a or right. B, right? Like, right. and so I think to be fair, that's what he's talking about being more yes. precise. Yes. But I, I, that's why I didn't bring it up in the moment. Yeah. And we were, but I was like, you know what? That you don't mean precise. It's not that you were not precise. You just committed, and you don't want to commit again. And I'm not saying, or, or uh, unjustifiably, like Wait. again, people ask me, people ask me all the time. Well, look, will the March and April SAT and ACT go off without a hitch? And I always tell them, like, I have no idea if the sun will be red and we will be trapped inside. I have no idea. I had students this last year that had gone to Nevada, I believe, uh, to take one of the tests. They drove up to Reno, you know, hit Tahoe for the weekend and then, then went to Reno uh, on the Saturday morning to take the test. And Reno had the test. They weren't shut down because of schools. They were shut down because the air quality was so bad. Yep. So. It's an it's a ridiculous thing, for, but I, unlike Dr. Moore, I figured that out like after the second week of COVID, which is, hey, stop saying you know anything because you don't know squat. Like th this is always evolving. Um, but people were asking for commitment. You know, I think that's what people are dying for because we have so little, we have so little real concrete take to the bank idea of how tomorrow is going to be well that's and i think that we've all learned that over the last right. 10 months is no one can i mean we all went out for two weeks in march and here we are 10 months later and no one's back right oh my gosh this is the longest two weeks to flatten the curve of my life yes 
Right. Well, and that was, I mean, and that's the thing. I was all about flattening the curve. I wear my mask. I wash my hands. I, I do everything I'm supposed to do because I really wanted to flatten the curve. <laughs> and then I thought, when did it become, you know, making it all go away? And the problem is then we had the big spike after the holidays, the second big spike after you know, after Thanksgiving and now the second big spike after Christmas. And now we're kind of flattening the curve again, right? I mean, the I think the, not that I think this is a valid measure, but the availability of the ICU beds has, you know, increased, so. You know what's interesting about that? Uh, I was having a discussion with my, my good friend, Kevin Kane, who's an engineer, and so he's, he's all about f- finding like he roots out he's like a truffle hound like he finds numbers that you would never think to look for and then he analyzes them and you're like dude i don't know just tell me what i need to know and it's very interesting because it is first off the idea that the hospitals were full like what does that mean when you say a hospital is full it's like does that mean every single bed is full does that mean every single bed that somebody with covid could have is full like there are all these different things and it's it's such a difficult, again, I think we're also finding that it's so difficult to get any kind of clarity with a real answer. Because what's very interesting is we can all go online right now. You can Google, you know, like Contra Costa County hospital occupancy, and you'll get a number where the hospital's recording on a daily basis how many how many spots they have. I was having this conversation with my wife just two weeks ago. I'm like, look, we have, there's one hospital who's at like 99% occupancy for the beds that they would give to COVID patients. That doesn't mean if you have like a peanut allergy that you'll get turned away. It just means for the beds that they would hold COVID people in, those are, as we know right now, occupied. But there's another hospital two miles away that's at like 70% capacity for this. So it's such a difficult thing to get to get those real numbers. And and again, yeah, we don't we don't know what Tomorrow is going to hold. He he was Dr. Moore was bringing up a very good point. He was like, "Do you remember July when we'd like wash groceries and stuff?" I was like, yeah. When you got your Amazon boxes and you let them oh sit my. on the porch for oh, three days because yes. you wouldn't didn't want to touch them. My, we we had <laughs> gloves. Like we put on gloves and masks, and we'd like had we had the sterilizing yeah. place. Like I'm surprised we didn't get one of those like UV light sterilizers. But like that was a real thing. And people were worried about it, but we become acclimated to the risks uh, around us. So if we if we were told in July that we would have the numbers that we currently have, we would assume the world was ending, like it's over. And and man, that's just not we get acclimated to it, you know. And I think the same thing has happened with flatten the curve. It's like two weeks, and then three weeks, and then like ten months, and just kind of acclimated to going along with the next thing shelter in place is over right yes i think did they announce it today right? it's something like that but the the, the whole joke is like wait were we in shelter in place it's like they have ended the regulation that nobody paid attention to anyway well the shelter in place was technically like the 10 p.m to 5 a.m that was oh and no outdoor dining and stuff yes right and right so you had to you know you you can only do essential activities between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. You can walk to the park, but you can't walk to the park with your neighbor if you're walking together. Right, but you can walk your dog to the park. Right. Right, right, right. And so. you can go to the store anytime you want. And if you happen to see your neighbor at the store, that's fine. Because it's an but essential activity. don't go to the park. <laughs> Maybe they need to put the parks in the grocery stores. I'm just throwing that out there. Right. Like a pizza or something. Well, I mean, the, and I think that's the big argument, right? That, like, you can go to Costco and be wall-to-wall people. Why can't you go to school? And so, I mean, that's – and I understand that. So I I started out in college as a, a math and physics major. And my mind is very I, – I, I like – numbers they always work you want me to do the saddle universe right rotate something around the x-axis i'm good with that so i like my numbers to fit and and i'm having a hard time with this because i feel like anybody can find any numbers to fit their argument like your friend kevin right so right you can you can flesh this out and this you know the person on this side of the argument can find all these numbers that fit their argument because the data is so vague and it Yes. I, and and there's no standards. There's no standard. Like, what is – our hospitals are full. What does that mean? Yeah. Right? And, and this is the thing. We're not all using the same vocabulary, and we're not all 
it's very it, nobody ever wants to say that somebody's lying especially when you don't know that person but people throw out things and they say things and you're like okay are you actually lying are you are you exaggerating which i wouldn't necessarily call lying but like it's kind of getting close or are you looking at data that was published 2 weeks ago and things are different now like there's no point in even talking to people because at the end of the day like you're saying people will seek the data that that backs up their position. I started as a math major at Cal, and then I switched to rhetoric. What what did you switch to from from math and science? Political science and psychology. Look at you! <laughs> Look at you! Look at I you! I dis- just I discovered I like to write. That's exactly what happened to me. And I then was... I I started tutoring the students at Cal. Once I had to take these remedial writing courses, and I fell in love with it. Switched to rhetoric. Start tutoring people in writing and math. Surprise, surprise, because I was studying math. That was that was a long time ago. That was like twenty years ago. Look I was an that. SAT tutor in, in college. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I taught a course called the Princeton Review. <laughs> God bless you, woman. That, that's I have what... Princeton Review books behind those backpacks. That's that's one of the test books I use. Well, I, I'll tell you where it came in handy is I um, started out teaching the SAT, and man, they paid so well. I you know worked eight hours a week right as a as a teacher. I taught class on Sunday and workshops you know one day during the week. And then I graduated to teaching the GRE, and then I graduated to teaching the LSAT. So what better way to prepare for the LSAT than to to teach the class for a couple of years? Yes. Yeah, I, I've always loved it. I really like tutoring. It's, yeah. it's one of those things. You get to be like the icing on top of the cake. Because yeah. you don't have to do the heavy lifting all year long. Like, you can just talk some trash and inspire a kid over a two month period. And then you're like, yes, I did it all. And his math teacher's slogging away with him every day. Well, and then I tell him, hey, you got the answers in front of you. Just plug them back into the equation, A, B, C, D. Plug them back in. Which one works? That's your answer. And, oh, and you know, you, they think that, you know. God, you really were an SAT tutor. You, so, you know what? If law doesn't work out for you, you know, I've never had employees. We can partner up in here. I'm all good with that. Yeah. No, no thank you. I'll, I'll stay away from it. So bottom line is it sounds like you have come at this from like an, just an infinitely practical, pragmatic stance, which is, hey, look, there there are benefits, but I don't – it doesn't seem like the recall will be – an immediate fix for issues. Now, if, if the elected representatives are not representing the population, they should be recalled. See, there you go. So it's not, so you mentioned earlier, well, by the time this happens, you know, we'll probably be back in school. But I don't think that that's the, you know, that's the issue right now. And But it's just an example of how, um, you know, they think that the board is not representing the interests of their students and I'm I'm of that group I mean I really do believe that and I think that there you really do believe the board is not doing a great job representing your the students interests right now gotcha gotcha yep, I do well and at least my student right who yeah. who wants to go back to school who's not staying away from school for COVID reasons but because the hybrid for him is a terrible option he, he wants to be back in school he wants to be playing baseball I mean, he's got there's there's a lot of things that he would really love to be doing right now, and right. he's not. So, and you know, quite frankly, there are you know he follows the rules. He wears. I mean, God bless these kids. They're really good about wearing masks. Much I think much better than adults. My my kid carries his mask everywhere. He never forgets. It. Whereas you know. As you know, I walked in today. I'm like, I gotta go get my mask. No, I, just, I normally when people walk in here, I'm already sitting here, and you just have to sit down. We don't get cl- closer than ten feet from each right. other, and I got the filters going. But yeah, you caught me. We were like going into the door at the same time. But right, right. No, it, and and you're right because you get people down at like Minars and Norms in the middle of the street getting in like altercations, no mask. But they're outside, so, you know. <laughs> That's okay. They can spit on each other, but yeah. oh it's just pissing in the air. How ridiculous. Like, how embarrassing that that was the Danville that, that people the saw. News. <laughs> I know. Like, just ding-dongs trashed outside. The people are stressed. You know, people are stressed out. They're trying to do They're trying to do what they can to get through the day. Well, but you know that that was well, the, the people that actually got kind of busted for that were a bunch of out-of-towners because they came to Danville because it had all the open, 
restaurants and you know the outside seating and so they everybody came into town so it was like a a rumble in the streets of Danville, you know. But. With the Antioch people. <laughs> Shout out Antioch. I did not I did not know that. I don't I don't frequent norms very often. I'm like I'm gluten free anyway, so I can't drink the beer. It's so a, it's such a sad life to be gluten free, let me tell you. I used to really like norms. But <laughs> yeah, no, I mean I, I in in all the time I've been working with my with my SAT SAT and ACT kids, I only had one kid who would regularly kind of let his, his mass drop a little bit. And, and I said, hey, look, man, here's the deal. You, you got to keep it on because if anybody ever asks, I want to be able to say I had everybody with their masks on and I don't, I don't want anyone to be, be at risk. Right. And, and I, I certainly don't want to – I don't want to have you at risk. So just put that thing on. And he was like, all right, that's fair. But, yeah, I haven't had, I haven't had any problem with the teenagers – teenagers doing that especially in a supervised uh supervised environment like greg um greg tram um came in and spoke and he said in in the supervised arena of sport when you have an actual coach you have somebody that can get everyone to follow the protocol and i think anybody who's ever been on a sports team knows when the coach leaves even if you have a captain of the team it's really hard to get the team to do what they're supposed to be doing because you're amongst your peers you know, it's very hard to, to really crack the whip with people that are your exact age. But if you have supervision, if you have a coach, you have a teacher, you have a parent, they can really they can really kind of appeal to the to the younger people's reason and just say, let's just put the mask on. Let's just because if we don't, we don't get to keep doing this, whatever it is. Well, and that's it. I think that's the motivation. So I don't think it would be a problem to have the kid. I mean, I'm talking high school because I think you have different issues at elementary and younger kids, right? That. You don't run into the high school kids. You tell them you want to be at school, wear your mask. There's always going to be the kids, you know, the same ones that sneak into the bathroom for various reasons. Various and assorted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Less than honorable reasons. My, my elementary kids love their masks. They, they think they're like ninjas and stuff. We get them cool ones with like pumpkins on them and lightning bolts and stuff. I mean, they, they really, they seem to do their part, which is great. Anyway, listen, I know it's late. I got to let you go. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I greatly appreciate the thanks perspectives. Thanks for having me, and thanks for you know asking me to come on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And again, I, I think I speak for everyone. Thank you for putting the effort out there to, to do the heavy lifting. I mean, the the legal the legal system and making requests and legalese, <laughs> that's a difficult thing for the average Joe. So thank you for giving that to us as well. Sure. Thank you. Have thank a you. good night. You too.